Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Ketchen, and I'm the Partnership Lead on the Adolescent Immunizations Communications Team here at CDC. And we are so happy that you could join us today for another preteen vaccine webinar entitled Research Project Update, AFIX Pro Program Strategies for Improving HPV Vaccination Rates in the Field. We are especially excited about today's presentation as a way to assist the many staff in the field conducting AFIX visits, other assessment and feedback um, meetings, or even quality improvement projects. You are in the unique position to directly help clinicians improve their um, coverage rates. Uh, the very first of the five goals in the President's Cancer Panel Report on accelerating HPV vaccine uptake is to reduce missed clinical opportunities to recommend and administer HPV vaccines. Your role is critical to the nation in achieving that goal as you help clinicians improve their HPV vaccination rates. Your work empowers clinicians to improve their systems, give an effective recommendation for HPV vaccination, and successfully answer parents' questions. So here at CDC, we, are, we so appreciate all of the blood, sweat, and tears that goes into this process. To help us in supporting you, we'll have some polling questions after the presentation. So this is your opportunity to let us know how else we can continue to assist you and your, the crucial work you do every day. So very quickly, we have a couple of housekeeping items to go over. Um, first of all, I want to remind everyone that your lines have been muted. Uh, please do not put your phone on hold. If you need to step away, you can hang up and dial back in when you can. And then um, we are recording this webinar, <clears throat> and we will also be posting this recording um, to our HPV portal website um, when it's ready, and we'll be sending out an announcement so everyone knows when it's posted. And then uh, finally, there will be a Q&A session after both presentations. So as you have questions, go ahead and type them into the chat panel on your lower left-hand corner in the screen. Um, and then that way when we do get to the Q&A part, we can be, we'll read a few of the questions out loud for our presenters to answer so that everyone um, knows the question, everyone can hear the answer. And then also we're going to go from one presentation to the next. So um, please feel free to specify which question or which presenter your questions for. So today we'll be hearing from Dr. Melissa Gilkey and Crystal Averett. Um, Dr. Gilkey is an assistant professor of population medicine at Harvard Medical School and Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare Institute. Her research interests include adolescent health, cancer prevention, and health services research. Melissa also studies individual, interpersonal, and organizational strategies to improving the delivery of HPV vaccine. She is currently funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to investigate opportunities for using CDC's AFIX model to increase HPV vaccination coverage in primary care settings. So joining Melissa is also Crystal Averett. Crystal is the AFIX and Quality Improvement Coordinator for Washington State, and she has worked for the Office of Immunization within the Department of Health for nine years. She is currently working on her Master's in Public Health with certification in Emergency Management, and Crystal's role is to engage partners and providers to implement quality improvement activities in order to raise immunization rates in children and adolescents. Um, so we are really excited to have both Melissa and Crystal, and with that, I will let um, Melissa get us started. Great. Well, thank you for joining me. Um, today, I'm going to be giving an update on our ongoing study, which has one goal, which is to raise HPV vaccination coverage among adolescents in primary care settings. Now, in this study, we aim to do that by developing new quality improvement tools that can be used in the context of AFIX visits. So I'm going to be taking you through the process that we're using to develop and evaluate these tools. But our take-home message is really that HPV vaccination poses some unique challenges for our healthcare system. And to address those challenges, we need to be thinking creatively about how to reach primary care providers so that we can communicate the problem of low HPV vaccination coverage and convince them to deliver high quality recommendations for the vaccine. Before I get started, I would like to take just a moment to acknowledge our great team, um, which at the University of North Carolina includes our co-PI, Noel Brewer. And we also have three great practice teams based at state health departments in Washington, Illinois, and Michigan. Um, we're lucky to have Crystal Ayrett, our team leader in Washington, on the call today. And in the second part of our presentation, she'll be sharing a practice perspective on what it's like to actually use some of our tools. 
So this is an exciting time to be doing research related to HPV vaccination because in the past few years, the issue of increasing coverage has really emerged as a national public health priority. So from the CDC to the President's Cancer Panel to professional organizations like the American Academy of Pediatrics, there's a recognition that this is really a winnable issue. This is a puzzle that we can solve, but it's going to take some quality improvement work to make that happen. So let me start by very briefly reviewing practice guidelines for the delivery of HPV vaccine. What's the goal here? Well, HPV vaccine is obviously a three-dose series, and it's administered over a six-month period of time. And on-time administration for males and females is targeted to ages 11 and 12. So again, that's what's considered the goal. That's what's on time. But if kids don't get HPV vaccine doses at 11 or 12, they can receive late doses on a catch-up schedule. So that's up to age 26 for females and men who have sex with men, and up to age 21 for other males. Despite these guidelines, we're unlikely to see the full benefit of HPV vaccination in the U.S. because our coverage levels remain so low. And I bet just about everyone on this call has now seen these data from the National Immunization Survey team, which show that HPV vaccination coverage continues to be much lower than coverage for other adolescent vaccines that were introduced around the same time. And that low coverage we know has very real public health consequences. So the CDC estimates that failing to meet the Healthy People 2020 goal, which is for 80% series completion, means that today's population of girls ages 12 and younger will experience 53,000 cervical cancer cases that we could have prevented with HPV vaccine. So we're missing a lot of opportunities to prevent cervical cancer. And we're also missing the opportunity to prevent other HPV attributable cancers and genital warts as well. So what's the problem? Um, well, it would be easy to assume that parents are the main barrier to HPV vaccination, since HPV vaccine, after all, has in the past been subject to some pretty public controversy. But when you ask parents why they haven't gotten HPV vaccine for their children, the answers are not always especially dramatic. So here are the main reasons parents of boys and girls report for not getting HPV vaccine as of 2013. Lack of knowledge, believing the vaccine isn't needed, and not having gotten a recommendation. So those are the top answers. And you'll notice that the concerns are largely informational. So parents don't know enough or they haven't gotten a recommendation. Um, and although concerns about safety and sex are there, they don't seem to be the main issues. So parents are certainly important decision makers and we do need to address their concerns and their communication needs. But research including our own suggests that providers may be even more important, at least from an intervention standpoint. When it comes to HPV vaccination, providers are incredibly influential. And here's a slide that's meant to show that. So in 2015, we conducted a national survey of parents of 11 to 17-year-old adolescents, and we asked them about their child's vaccination status, as well as um, whether their child's provider had ever recommended HPV vaccination. And if you look at the cluster bars on the left, you can see that coverage for HPV vaccine initiation or receiving at least one dose was very low for kids who hadn't gotten a provider recommendation. So that's that bar shown in the green. Just 23% of kids who hadn't gotten a recommendation had started the series. By contrast, kids who had gotten a lower quality recommendation, meaning that the provider had recommended HPV vaccination, but didn't say that it was very important or recommended it for that particular visit, were doing better. So overall, 53% um, in that category had started the series, as shown in the dark blue. And then kids who had received a high quality recommendation, meaning that the provider had said it was really important that they should get it that day, were doing even better. So looking at that light blue bar, you can see that three quarters of those kids had started a series. And then the second cluster of bars on the right shows that same pattern, but for three dose completion among kids who had started the series. So the bottom line is that what providers say matters giving even a low quality recommendation is substantially better than nothing, but high quality recommendations are incredibly influential with parents. And this is a consistent finding across both the qualitative and quantitative literature. Unfortunately, we know that not all eligible adolescents are getting recommendations. So based on parental report, about a third of girls and over half of boys haven't received a recommendation. 
So we need for providers to deliver recommendations for HPV vaccine more often. We also need for providers to improve the quality of their recommendations. So that last slide suggested, as we would expect, that high quality recommendations are influential, but we know that providers don't always deliver them. So in a prior study of physicians, we found that half reported using two or more lower quality communication practices for recommending HPV vaccines. So in other words, they were doing things like not necessarily saying that HPV vaccine was very important for 11 to 12 year olds, or they weren't recommending same day vaccination. So what do we do? Um, well, this is a conceptual model that my team uses to think about this problem. If the research indicates that we need to improve providers' behavior, in this case their prescribing behaviors, then our model suggests that we need to focus on the determinants of that behavior, which include providers' knowledge, attitudes, and skills, as well as clinical systems that serve to do things like flag eligible patients and use remind or recall. And that's where AFIX comes in. So AFIX stands for Assessment, Feedback, Incentives, and Exchange, and it's a model of immunization quality improvement developed by CDC. So AFIX is based on a process of assessment and feedback in which a quality improvement specialist from a state or regional health department visits primary care clinicians to share information about how the clinic is doing in terms of immunizing its patient population. In the old days, that might meant pulling charts and calculating coverage estimates for the clinic that way, but now it's increasingly pop possible to use data from state's vaccine registries to accomplish that goal. The specialist may provide training to clinic staff as well as other resources to incentivize improved performance. And then after about five to six months, the specialist gets back in touch with the clinic to provide updated coverage estimates to let providers know whether their quality improvement efforts are working. Now for early childhood vaccines, AFIX has been shown to improve immunization coverage by about five percentage points, so it is an evidence-based approach. And based on this evidence, CDC recommends that health departments provide AFIX visits to at least a quarter of federally funded vaccine providers each year. So this is a quality improvement program that's already happening on a very big scale. And in, in this way, it's an amazing opportunity to improve HPV vaccination because in terms of reach, there's just really nothing else like it. Now just a quick note on theory, AFIX is informed by continuous quality improvement or the CQI method. So in its ideal form, CQI involves rapid cycles of development in which you try out an innovation and then you use data to see if it works, with the emphasis really being on the process and improving that process versus assigning blame. And AFIX is definitely data-driven in that primary care clinics are asked to try out a quality improvement strategy and then are given data to see if that strategy worked. AFIX also really embraces that spirit of experimentation and collaboration. So clinics may be provided with incentives for improving immunization coverage, but they aren't punished if they don't succeed. Instead, the goal of AFIX is really to draw on providers' own motivation to improve, which is one of the defining features of CQI. Now where AFIX has usually differed from CQI is with the follow-up. So typically clinics don't have continuous rapid cycles, but instead they get an AFIX consultation once a year or um, once every few years, which is somewhat different from a, a pure CQI approach. So again, I, I think it's um, fair to say that AFIX is informed by CQI, not that it is CQI. So having this theory-informed quality improvement program made us curious about the possibility of using AFIX to improve adolescent vaccine coverage. If we have this program that's already being implemented in all 50 states like AFIX is, why not use it for the vaccines that need it most? So that question inspired our collaboration with the North Carolina Immunization Branch in 2011. Together we designed a three-arm RCT with 91 high-volume primary care clinics in which clinics got an adolescent AFIX delivered in person in the traditional way, an AFIX visit delivered by interactive webinar, or no AFIX for visit for our control group. Our sample included 53 pediatric clinics and 38 family practice clinics serving a total of over 100,000 patients ages 11 to 18. And here we can see our main outcomes at five months. So on this graph, we see vaccine coverage changes by study arm for younger adolescents. These bars represent the number of percentage points by which immunization coverage in each study arm improved for patients ages 11 to 12. 
The first bar in the cluster is the control group, and that shows the secular trend, followed by the in-person group and the webinar group. So the first cluster of bars on the left shows how coverage changed for TDAP. And we can see that the two intervention arms um, had coverage changes that were about four points higher than the control. So we found that AFIX did have an impact on Tdap coverage. And then we see a similar pattern with regard to meningococcal vaccine. Now for HPV vaccine, we did find a statistically significant intervention effect, but it was smaller, so just one and a half to two points over the control. Now a secondary study aim was to compare the intervention arms to each other. And as you would probably guess by looking at the graph, we didn't find evidence to suggest that the two delivery modes, in-person or webinar, differed in terms of effectiveness. So webinars seemed to do just about as well as, as in-person AFEX. So all in all, we felt like this was pretty good news. We would have liked to have seen more impact on HPV vaccination, but we did get some intervention effect, and we saw some evidence to suggest that webinar is a promising delivery mode. Now, unfortunately, an analysis that we conducted of outcomes at one year suggests that the improvements we saw at five months didn't persist. So at one year, coverage for Tdap, meningococcal vaccine, and HPV vaccine initiation was about the same across the three arms. Now keep in mind that these are, are pilot data, and they're pilot data, data that are now about five years old. And both HPV vaccination coverage and the AFIX program itself have changed considerably over that time. So this pilot study certainly is not the last word in terms of AFIX effectiveness, but it did provide us with some important clues, specifically this idea that to maximize AFIX impact for HPV vaccination, we might require an extra boost. It may take a little something special. So that brings us to the present study in which we wanted to design and evaluate some HPV vaccine specific tools that could be used in the context of AFIX visits. Through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we were awarded funds for a study that has the explicit goal of improving HPV vaccination uh, coverage. And our study had three aims. First, we wanted to conduct some formative research to identify key challenges to HPV vaccination quality improvement. Second, we wanted to develop quality improvement tools and strategies that were responsive to those challenges. And then finally, we wanted to evaluate those tools in a randomized controlled trial in partnership with three state health departments. Again, our first step was formative research to understand the challenges for doing HPV vaccination quality improvement. So to do that, we had conversations with a lot of different AFIX stakeholders. We talked with health departments on our advisory committee and on our practice teams. We talked to vaccine providers who had received adolescent AFIX visits, and we also got a lot of great feedback and support from the AFIX program office at CDC. So through this process, we walked away with a short list of key messages that were critical to informing the tools we developed, and I want to share three of those with you today. So our first challenge, when we compiled the results of our interviews, one of the most striking themes was that oftentimes providers receiving AFIX didn't see their HPV vaccination coverage as a problem. So their perspective was, yeah, the coverage estimates might be low in the clinic, but that was also true at the state and national level. And from their perspective, that's just how HPV vaccination is. It's normal. There's not really anything that you can do about it. So we saw some potential for some real miscommunication here. The AFIX reviewer could be presenting these really low coverage estimates for a clinic and assuming that the provider could see a problem and would be motivated to act. But in the provider's eyes, low coverage was just to be expected. So we used this challenge to think about what our goals needed to be. We needed to find a way of communicating the problem of low HPV vaccination coverage in a way that providers could really recognize and hear. We also wanted to motivate them by convincing them of their influence with parents, teaching them some communication skills for recommending HPV vaccine, and really building their confidence and their optimism with regard to recommending the vaccine. One way we did this was to develop an immunization report card that you can see here. So the report card has three parts. The first section presents coverage estimates. The second helps providers to set a goal for improving coverage. And the third gives some basics about how to recommend HPV vaccine effectively. So let's take a look at that first section, which gives the coverage estimates. Here, we report the number of patients in the clinic who are in or beyond the target for adolescent vaccines. And then we present coverage estimates focusing on HPV, meningococcal, and Tdap vaccines. 
you'll notice that we tried to keep the report card really streamlined, and we purposefully excluded state and national coverage estimates because we wanted to further avoid, uh, excuse me, avoid further normalizing low HPV vaccination coverage. So instead, the comparison that we wanted to providers to make um, was between their HPV vaccination coverage, which is typically low, to their meningococcal and Tdap coverage, which is typically quite high. So that the idea is to set set you up for what's having essentially an assets-based conversation. So to be able to say you're doing really well with regard to meningococcal vaccine and Tdap vaccines, but your HPV vaccine coverage is low and needs some work. So we wanted to keep the conversation as positive as possible and to maintain that collaborative AFIC spirit. So another thing you might notice is that even though this is called a report card, we don't give providers a letter grade on their coverage estimates. It's something that we considered, but we ultimately decided against it because AFIX is not supposed to be about blame. And the reality is that if graded by the Healthy People 2020 goal of 80% coverage, most clinics would get an F at the start of the project. Not only that, even if they made substantial progress in their HPV vaccination coverage over the course of the project, they might still have an F at the end. So since we wanted to set providers up for success and maintain this kind of positive collaborative approach, we decided that grading was not the way to go for HPV vaccination. So that's step one of the report card. The second part of the report card helped providers to set a six-month goal for improving their HPV vaccination coverage. And for the purposes of this study, we asked clinics to try to immunize 10% of their patients in the six-month period. Now we set this goal um, somewhat arbitrarily, but the point was to emphasize that we were expecting them to act to improve their coverage and in a way that was measurable, in a way that they could track. So we chose to set the goal in terms of the number of patients in each age group that they would have to vaccinate to meet their goal. And our hope here was that thinking in terms of the number of people instead of in terms of kind of vague coverage estimates would help communicate what needed to be done and also hopefully make it seem a little bit more manageable. And later in the presentation, um, Kristen, Crystal will speak to what it's like to have these conversations with providers. We also have a place on the report card where the AFIX reviewer can provide an interim report to show progress toward the goal at three months. And a final report at six months to show whether the goal was achieved. So for this pretend clinic, you can see that they did make their goals. They needed to give the first dose of HPV vaccine to 57 11 to 12 year old patients and they vaccinated 60. They needed to give HPV vaccine to 76 13 to 17 year old patients and they vaccinated 80. And then the last section of the report card emphasizes the importance of provider recommendations. So here we model a high quality recommendation by saying your child needs three shots to take, meningitis, HPV, and Tdap vaccines. And then the AFIX reviewer can use this example to point out why this is a good recommendation. So it's an approach that expects a yes by being short and direct. It normalizes HPV vaccination by presenting it kind of sandwiched between meningococcal and Tdap vaccines. And it also emphasizes same day vaccination. So your child needs three shots today. So this is that same way, same day approach. And then we also direct the provider to online resources for learning more about HPV vaccination quality improvement. So we tried to set up the report card in a way that could structure the discussion within an AFIX visit, but which was also portable. So we wanted this to be something that providers participating in the visit could share with providers who might not be able to attend. And that brings us to a second and closely related challenge that we identified over the course of our formative work. We know that reaching vaccine providers, and especially the physicians and mid-level providers who are prescribing vaccines, is really critical to HPV vaccination quality improvement. But our key informant interviews suggested that this was a really difficult task to accomplish. So given their busy schedules, it's obviously hard to get providers time. In addition, we learned that health departments are often limited in terms of the resources they have available to incentivize participation. So if you're doing dozens of these visits each year, like a lot of states are, the cost can really add up quickly. The other thing we learned from states is that they sometimes face constraints in terms of what they can purchase for incentives. So for example, it's increasingly difficult to cover food as an allowable expense. 
And finally, it's hard to know what will really motivate providers. So for example, if you go with an incentive like a plaque or other forms of rec recognition, that might only motivate the providers who are already high performers. So based on these findings, we knew our goal was to identify new incentives for participation that would be at low cost, allowable expenses for states, but still motivating to a wide variety of providers. So our study drew on the collective wisdom of our advisory board, uh, of our state partners, and developed a couple of strategies for trying to get providers involved. First, we found a mechanism that we could use to offer free CMEs to physicians and nurses who participated in the AFIX visit. So our visits were accredited by AAFP, um, which for a $600 application fee allowed us to give one hour of AMA Category 1 credit for any provider participating in our program. Now there were some strings attached, so providers could only claim one hour if they participated in the visit for an hour. And they also had to fill out a brief uh, online survey. But all in all, our states found that this was a good way to get more providers to the table. To support the CME activity, we developed a didactic presentation which included PowerPoint slides that AFIX reviewers could use to share data on HPV and HPV vaccination. And this was also important for motivating providers' participation because they really liked seeing the evidence. So Crystal will say more about her experience using this presentation, but two messages that were especially powerful were that HPV vaccination has cancer prevention benefits for boys. Not all providers knew that and that adolescents can achieve a better immune response if they receive HPV vaccine on time versus later. So providers um, participating in the study really wanted a rationale for on-time vaccination. And finally, we developed what we called a quality improvement action plan. You can see what that looks like here. So the purpose of this form was really, again, to structure a conversation with providers about how they were going to prioritize quality improvement efforts in their clinic and mobilize other providers to get involved. Um, so there were three sections. In the first, we asked all clinics to commit to sharing coverage estimates and discussing the importance of high-quality HPV vaccine recommendations. In the second section, providers could select secondary strategies like reviewing guidelines and training staff. And in the third section, we asked providers to brainstorm about how they could get the word out in their clinic to providers who were not able to attend the AFIX visit. So this could include strategies like discussing the AFIX visit um, during a staff meeting. Now in actual practice, we found that providers were not always able to select a quality improvement strategy at the time of the AFIX visit. So sometimes they needed time to discuss various strategies with other providers and to make a decision as a team, and that's okay. Um, the goal was really to get them started with thinking about different strategies and to make sure um, they were doing at least two things, sharing coverage estimates and discussing the importance of high quality HPV vaccine recommendations. And that brings us to our last major quality improvement challenge, which was maintaining providers' momentum and focus once they were involved. So in our key informant interviews, we heard a lot about the competing demands that can get in the way of HPV vaccine quality improvement. In a very real way, AFIX has to compete for providers' attention. It has to compete with other quality improvement programs, other systems level changes like the transition to electronic medical records, as well as just the crush of the day-to-day -day work involved in seeing patients. So another goal that we set for ourselves was to create opportunities to keep in touch with providers and to find low burden ways of keeping AFIX visible. And here we built in a number of strategies. One was the use of an interim progress report on our report card, which I mentioned previously. So three months after the AFIX visit, we got back in touch with clinics to let them know whether they were on track to meet their six-month goal. And if they weren't on track, this gave them a chance to reevaluate their quality improvement strategies and get reorganized. If they were on track, this often gave them the encouragement that they needed to keep going. Another strategy that we developed is what we called email coaching. So using a few ready-to-use templates, our AFIX reviewers got in touch with providers at regular intervals to share educational resources and to just more generally keep in touch so that AFIX was something that providers continued to think about. So for example, the email might contain CDC's Tips and Time Savers Guide for talking about HPV vaccine, or states might share resources they had developed themselves. So again, the purpose was really to keep AFIX on their radar. 
So I'll end this section of the talk with a summary slide that shows what our intervention looked like once we put it all together. So step one was to schedule clinics. So here we were using the CME incentives to try to get providers to the table. Step two was conducting the AFIX visits, and this involved using the report card to communicate the problem of low HPV vaccination coverage and to set a measurable quality improvement goal. Um, using the PowerPoint presentation to improve providers' knowledge and build their communication skills, and then using the action plan to help the visit participants engage other providers in the clinic. And finally, step three was to conduct follow-up activities, which included giving clinics progress reports and conducting email coaching to share educational resources and just to more generally stay in touch. So once we had developed our materials, our next step was to evaluate them in an RCT, which started almost a year ago in our three partner states. And again, our practice teams are located in the state health departments of Washington, Michigan, and Illinois. And we on the research side have been incredibly lucky to have these partnerships. So in the RCT, the practice teams are primarily responsible for delivering AFIX visits using the tools and strategies um, that I've been describing, but they were also integral to the development and the pilot testing of our intervention. Uh, we've really looked through to them throughout the whole process to help us understand just what it's like to deliver AFIX visits, um, what motivates providers, and what's feasible in the real world context of state health departments. So when I talk about states, I'm not just talking about a setting in which our study happens to take place, but real partnerships in which our teams were working together to create our materials in the shared study. So our study design is based on the North Carolina pilot, so it should look very familiar. Um, we again have three arms, but instead of working in one state, we're working in three. Uh, within each state, clinics were assigned to receive AFIX visits delivered in person, uh, AFIX visits delivered by interactive webinar, or no AFIX control. And our partners delivered visits um, in May through October of 2015. Now we'll follow these clinics for a year to determine whether our intervention was successful in improving HPV vaccination coverage. Now since data collection for our trial is ongoing, we don't yet have vaccination outcomes, but I can share with you the components of our evaluation as well as some preliminary findings from our process evaluation. So our primary outcome is change in HPV vaccine initiation, meaning one or more doses at six month follow-up but we're also going to be looking at coverage at three, nine, and 12 months to understand how the impact of AFIX changes over time. So these data will come from states' vaccine registries. To assess issues related to fidelity to protocol, um, we have conducted observations for a subset of our webinar sessions, and this has been really a great opportunity to explore how the intervention is adopted and adapted by each state. To understand how vaccine providers receive AFIX in terms of their satisfaction, engagement, we've conducted online surveys with providers at three time points, right before the visit, right afterwards, and at six month follow up. So we're also studying the cost of delivering AFIX from the perspective of state health departments. We're really lucky to be working with a health economist, William Callow, who's able to track resources devoted to the project using, using tools like time logs. And then finally, and I think most importantly, we've met with our state partners on an ongoing basis by phone to get their feedback on how implementation was going. And we'll use these meeting notes to not only understand how the intervention works, but also to compile a list of key forms of technical assistance that can accompany our training guide. Again, we don't yet have um, data to report on how our study impacted vaccination coverage, but I would like to share some preliminary process findings that we find really encouraging. So this graph shows data on provider satisfaction with the AFIX visits they received on three key measures, which you can see along the x-axis. Facilitation, so whether they thought the AFIX reviewer did a good job, and then also convenience and ease of understanding of the visit overall. So the blue bars show responses given by providers who received in-person visits, and the green bars show responses for those who received webinar visits. And before conducting these surveys, we had decided that our goal was to ch achieve mean scores of at least four on a five-point scale. And you can see that we met this goal for all three measures and in both conditions. So it, we achieved a high level of satisfaction, and we see this as being really important because it helps to set that collaborative tone that AFIX needs to be effective at engaging providers. And then, of course, I think it also really speaks to the quality of the work that was being done by our state partners. 
In addition to satisfaction, we also used provider surveys before and after AFIX visits to assess changes in intermediate outcomes. So again, you can see these along the x-axis. We wanted to know whether our AFIX visits change providers' perceptions about whether HPV vaccine quality improvement is important, um, whether low coverage is a problem, whether they believe their clinic can improve, and whether they believe they themselves can be a part of that QI effort. So in this scenario, the blue bars show what providers said before the visit, and the green bars show what they said after the visit. And here we found statistically significant increases in three of our four variables. HPV vaccination coverage is lower than I'd like, our clinic can improve, and I can help. So again, these measures speak to our goals of communicating a problem and increasing provider self-efficacy to address that problem. So in terms of next steps, we will continue to collect outcomes data on vaccination coverage through October of this year. And once we have those data, we'll be able to assess whether our in-person and webinar interventions were successful in raising HPV vaccination coverage. We'll also be working on our process evaluation during this time, which includes a comparison of our webinar and in-person delivery modes on cost, satisfaction, and effectiveness. So here, we want to use qualitative and quantitative data to understand trade-offs in using each of these delivery modes. And we'll also explore different ways that states plan to use webinars. So for example, one of our states is thinking about giving clinics an option about which kind of AFIX visit they want. Another plans to use webinar just for high performing, performing clinics that um, need a check-in but are, are doing pretty well overall. So please stay tuned for those findings. So I'm about to turn the presentation over to Crystal um, for the practice team perspective. But before doing that, I want to sum up by returning to our key points from the research side of things. So first, this idea that AFIX is a real opportunity. By pairing AFIX as a quality improvement approach with some of what we're learning about how to improve provider recommendations, we can reach a lot of providers with a really important message. Now, I actually think that AFIX is one of our best chances for raising HPV vaccination coverage nationally. So the work going on within state and regional health departments and when, within the National AFIX Program Office is really valuable. To make quality improvement work for HPV vaccination, however, our research suggests that we need to think carefully about how to overcome a few key challenges. And this is true not only for AFIX, but probably more broadly for a lot of the quality improvement work that we try to do with primary care providers. So we need to think creatively for solutions about communicating the problem of low HPV vaccination coverage, incentivizing provider participation, building provider skills, confidence, optimism, setting measurable goals, and then maintaining a focus on quality improvement over time. So we hope that in the future, our study will contribute one set of tools for achieving these goals, but we acknowledge that there are many others, and we need to challenge ourselves to continue to think about these issues. So on that note, I'd like to thank you all for having me and invite you to get in touch with me if you'd like to know more about our study. Um, and I'll now turn the presentation over to my colleague, Crystal Averitt. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. Hello, I'm Crystal Averitt, the AFIX coordinator for Washington State. Increasing HPV vaccination coverage rate is a high priority for our agency and for our state. It has been listed as part of our Governor's Healthiest Next Generation initiative. I am personally passionate about raising HPV vaccination rates in our state because I used to work in a women's health clinic where I was there to hold hands during uh, biopsies of cervix and hand out tissues when they were given out the diagnosis of cancer in situ. That was over 15 years ago, and most of these issues can be eliminated by a vaccine. Today, I will be discussing how we applied the University of North Carolina HPV Vaccine Quality Improvement Activity to Washington State AFIX visits. The overall recruitment of providers for the AFIX was a success. We would call or email providers from our list. We would explain it's a special session of AFIX, which is part of the VFC uh, visit where we discuss immunization rates in our clinic. Some of the key recruitment strategies we use um, that you were recommended by your local health as a strong provider that would do well with this activity. It offers continuing education, and it will improve HPV coverage rates in your clinic. We were really directive and gave them a few dates and asked uh, when was their next staff meeting. 
see if we could come and present this educational session, session on improving HPV coverage rates within the clinic. Clinics would then counter back with other dates and times, and a few of them asked if they could bring in their other clinics. We had two sessions uh, that had at least four different clinics at one time. Total, we completed 68 HPV AFIX visits, which were a combination of both in-person and webinar. For the webinar, we used uh, GoToMeeting software because this is what our agency approves for use. Both sessions were made to be interactive to get feedback and input from those who attended. We used our state staff to conduct these visits. One thing I want to also want to mention Al, that we had more last minute uh, cancellations during the webinars uh, versus uh, going out and seeing uh, providers in person. For the assessment portion of the visit, we exported data from our immunization information system. At the end of 2015, we had 192 organizations representing 1,100 healthcare facilities who submitted data uh, to our IS through HL7 interfaces, and many more who shared data through other methods. We used the birth date ranges for 11 and 12 and 13 to 17 year olds uh, using the as of data as close as possible to the scheduled visit. Data was then imported into COCASA software to measure the adolescent coverage rates for the uh, two age cohort. We used the diagnostic report and the HPV report for the AVIX visits. During the feedback session, we used a PowerPoint education tool that was provided to us by UNC that was specifically around the HPV. The education tool discussed the disease prevalence consequences related to the types of cancer, vaccine safety and efficacy, and reasons for vaccinating at 11 and 12 years of age. The education tool covered other topics to include changing provider behavior on how to recommend the vaccine to parents. Um, HPV-9 was also addressed in the feedback session since it was uh, approved a few months prior to starting the visit. Personally, I found this as a great way to do feedback with the clinics because the images and data were great conversation pieces. It was also a great tool to teach new reviewers on feedback skills. Also, during the feedback session, the provider received their immunization report card that included their adolescent assessment rates, which compared one dose of Tdap, uh, meningococcal, and HPV, and put all three on a level playing ground to show the missed opportunities to the clinic. We discussed the Healthy People 2020 goals for all three adolescent vaccines and what the national and uh, state average were compared uh, for the series um, to the clinic. And then they were presented uh, their report card. There was a spin on the immunization report, report card. The goal was for the clinics to increase the number of adolescents who started their first dose, uh, which was based on 10% of their population. We asked during the feedback session, do you think that this is an achievable goal over the next six months? We never had one clinic say that this was too hard of a goal to reach for them. The HPV focus visits also included a secondary quality improvement plan besides the one that was in the AFIX online tool. We presented the clinic with uh, both after going through the questionnaire. Clinic improvement plan was to ensure that all clinic members are aware of the adolescent coverage rates and are educated on when adolescent vaccines should be given. Clinic members that attended the HPV quality improvement activity received CME once they completed the post-visit survey. Clinics were also sent pre-visit survey before the educational activity began. And then we followed up with them at six months after the visit to gain more insight about the delivery method and if they were encouraged to recommend the vaccine. For larger facilities and organizations, the ability to offer CME was enticing to allow us to do an AFIX visit and reach physicians, physician assistants, and nurse practitioners. Another incentive we have is our state award known as Immunize Washington. This award was created as a, a part of a partnership with various health plans in Washington State. It was created because providers were confused about different immunization measures from various groups. The award was set to align measures from AFIX, HEDIS, NIS, and other health plans so that 
providers have one common group of standards to work on regarding immunizations. 2015, for the adolescent series, there were no gold status providers, which means that they had to reach 80% or better for the series. This is the second year that we had the board, and there was one provider who was a gold status winner for adolescents, compared to 41 providers who reached this level for the childhood series. Increased uh, publicity about the war during the AFIS, AFIX visits let them know to reach the ward for the third dose completion that they need to begin with increasing their first dose. Clinics receive follow-up assessments at three months and six months, along with monthly tips and education materials to remind them of their goal. I delivered this AFIX site visit in person at a staff meeting, and I had every provider in the practice to include all their support staff. Clinic had a great HPV dose rate to start with, but there was room for improvement. The medical provider realized after seeing the report card breakdown that they noticed that their male rates were lower compared to their female rates and made a commitment to uh, make a stronger re recommendation to get the boys vaccinated. At the end of six months, the dose one for males, 11 and 12 year olds, went from 70% to 83%. And for 13 to 17 year old males, it went from 80% to 91%. The clinic's six month progress report was in de December. The clinic's uh, rates for all adolescent vaccines had uh, improved since then. Male and female rates of HPV are at 93% for dose one for the 13 to 17 year olds and 84% for 11 to 12 year olds. I read reassessed the clinics in May and they were able to maintain the rates even after the quality improvement activity was completed. There were a few challenges that we experienced while doing the HPV focused APEX visit. One of them was the introduction of the HPV-9 vaccine which there were some allocation issues at the beginning uh, because we wanted to make sure that all clinics were using up their HPV-4 vaccine. Washington is a universal vaccine state in which health plans contribute funding for vaccines. Increased cost of HPV-9 affected the budget. So cost of software also uh, did not recognize the CPT code for HPV-9 until we received a patch. We had to go back and reassess clinics and give them updated report cards during uh, a two-month period. Many clinics were also panicking because uh, they didn't have a 60-day supply on hand, and they were scared they were going to um, not have enough vaccine to complete the uh, project. However, no one ever ran out of vaccine. We also had to ensure that our local health could meet their own AFIX site visit requirements. And we were not uh, double booking and seeing the same provider. During 2015, there were many different HPV vaccine outreaches uh, from many different groups to include our own campaign and grant. Um, some of the providers were just getting tired of the topic, hearing about it. So our next step is to continue to do the HPV focused uh, visits to improve rates, um, explore CME for our AFIX visits, and increase the number of immunized Washington winners for adolescent for gold and silver status. The HPV uh, focused affixes that was part of a team effort here at Washington. And I want to say a special thanks to Nicole who led the project for the first two phases and did the majority of the affix visits. Wendy for her help with the affix uh, visits and Stefan who was our data leak. And of course uh, Janelle our supervisor for support during this project. And here's my contact information if you have any other questions that you want to send um, offline. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Crystal and Melissa, for um, taking the time to walk us through all of your information and um, details and how everything went. Um, so as Melissa and Crystal catch their breath for a second, we will go ahead and move into a quick poll. Um, first question is, how helpful was the information presented during this webinar? If you could go ahead and click your um, opinion. One more second.
Excellent. So we'll move to the next question, which is how likely are you to use the information presented during this webinar? And there you go. All right, so now we'll move into the um, Q&A part of our presentation. And it looks like we had, there are quite a lot of questions for you ladies. So um, if it's okay, we'll get to some of them now. Um, but I definitely want to respect everyone's time and be done on time. So we'll, whatever questions we don't get to, we'll log. Um, and then if Melissa and Crystal have time, um, maybe you could answer the few, a few individually. It should be like 10 or 12, if that's okay. Um, Absolutely, yeah. Okay, great. So, Melissa, we have quite a few for you as far as your um, study des design, I think. Um, so the very first one was, what specifically constituted a low versus high quality um, besides words from the doctor? Were there written materials or videos or other media used to kind of gauge that? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the um, starting point for this study was to come up um, with a framework for thinking about what constituted a quote-unquote good provider recommendation for HPV vaccination. So we used um, practice guidelines and the research literature, and we identified um, four key components. One was consistency, um, so recommending the vaccine to all patients, not just those that you perceive to be at high risk. Um, timeliness, so that meant um, recommending HPV vac vaccine by age 12. Urgency, so recommending that kids get it the same day versus at a, a later visit. And then strength of endorsement, so um, saying that HPV vaccine is very important for kids instead of less so. Um, originally, we had also planned to assess um, emphasizing um, cancer prevention, but since all providers, uh, almost, I mean, it was something about like 97% of providers said that they did this, we didn't include that in our framework because there just wasn't variation in it. So that was our starting point point for thinking about what a strong or a good recommendation is. And, and so um, those all did focus on um, communication practices, so things that providers said. We did not include things like um, using materials like the VIS or that kind of thing, um, just because we don't feel that there is um, enough evidence to support that uh, in the particular context of HPV vaccination. That said, there may be in the future. So we have this, we've set this kind of as a framework for a starting point, and we hope that over time we'll be able to add um, more components about what constitutes a high quality recommendation as we, as we um, collect more evidence and understand more about what works. Excellent. Um, we have another question. This is more of a general question, I think. So one big problem for many studies is measuring immunization rates using the registry. Um, providers improve by going into the registry and make it so they are not the provider for teens who have not come in for two years. So they're, they're cha kind of changing the denominator. Um, is there a way that you addressed any registry issues? Yeah. So as far as rates? Is something that we have heard from states that it is possible to kind of go in and cook the books if you um, you know take out some some of the kids who are in the denominator at the beginning of the study um, it, from a, a research standpoint one way that we try to account for this is by doing um, retrospective assessments of coverage so at a six month mark we'll, we'll kind of freeze the um, population in the clinic at the six month mark and then use that population to look back in time and see what those kids' vaccination status was at baseline and then again at the study period. So that's one way to make sure that you're assessing the same, um, the same kids from a, uh, a re from a research standpoint to kind of get the same population. That does come with its own limitations. So obviously um, you may be missing kids who um, leave the clinic before that um, follow-up time period. So it's not perfect, but for research that's one thing we've done. Um, and another thing, and maybe Crystal can speak to this, but we've heard that um, 
we've heard from our states that presenting um, the, the quality improvement goal in terms of the number of kids instead of a change in coverage has also helped some in that regard. Um, not because because providers could not still go into the registry and, and delete some of the um, inactive records to change their denominator, but it just doesn't occur to them, right? So if you're, if you're presenting it in terms of the number of kids that they need to vaccinate, um, it seems as though that idea doesn't, um, is, is, it just doesn't occur to them. And so in, instead they're thinking about um, the number of kids they need to vaccinate. Crystal, do you want to add anything there? Um, you know, when we were doing the AFIX visit, we really never uh, discussed about going up and doing registry cleanup. We just really focused on um, get any new kid that comes in to start their vaccine. That's what we really wanted the provider to focus on. And we um, kind of focused on them running their own cover, uh, coverage rate reports uh, so they could see where they're at for uh, both adolescent and uh, childhood. Excellent. Um, Melissa, there are quite quite a few questions about if your templates would be available for sharing um, as far as the report cards. Is that an option or? Yeah, absolutely. I would en encourage anybody who would like to, um, to see materials or ask questions to feel free to get in touch with me. Um, uh, the CDC National Program Office is, is working on their own report card, um, and so you know, I think that that's something that will um, be coming out soon, but we're, we're certainly um, more than happy to kind of share resources and, and um, so you can get a closer look at it and kind of see how it works up close. Okay, excellent. Well, um, it is two o'clock, so I'm. I, well, I have two o'clock. I'm going to go ahead and um, conclude the webinar right now. But um, for everyone, thank you so much, everyone, for being on the call and for submitting all of your questions. We will, like I said, we will log these questions and um, we will get you answers. Um, I think we can email you through your registration. So. Um, look forward to receiving an email from us. But again, thank you so much. Um, Another reminder, please feel free to, see, to send any additional comments or questions you have for us at CDC to our team inbox, preteenvaccines at cdc.gov. And then for more information, you can also visit cdc.gov slash HPV. Um, we welcome any feedback, comments, suggestions, or again, if you have additional questions, we um, can put you in contact with Melissa or feel free to, um, Melissa or Crystal, and feel free to contact them directly. Um, but thank you so much and have a great day.